Welcome, everyone. Thank you for attending. Um, please make yourself comfortable as we start this session. Today, uh, we will delve into two integral aspects of Blender's arsenal. So, driver functions and shader nodes. This talk goes over um, all aspects of my visual workflow. And, uh, and its main pur purpose is to be an overview of the key features I have been using uh, for a long time now. Uh, with that said, some of the, those topics are intermediate to advanced level and are already, as soon as you know, your way around the user interface alongside some vector math operations. Uh, that goes for both folks watching online and the live audience here. And uh, I, I think that most of you will be eager to nerd out about some of the process shown. So we can do a formal Q&A by the end of the session and continue later. A little bit of context about myself. Uh, my name is Luis Kirbini. I'm an artist which has been focusing on real-time rendering and composting for a uh, great part of my career. Having spent uh, four uh, enriching years uh, as part of the Sketchfab team at Epic Games, uh, one of my mo most fulfilling achievements there was uh, co-running the Blender Council, which was a short-term uh, initiative to spread, uh, spread uh, Blender awareness and adoption within the company. So with over uh, 12 years of experience in the realm of 3D content creation, uh, I had the privilege of witnessing uh, Blender's remarkable evolution right uh, into a Swiss knife of creative potential. Um, for sure, there are areas that are still very unpolished and requires further development uh, for real time, especially, such as baking and authoring textures. But uh, it's with those limitations in mind that uh, I come in harmony with the areas that it truly really shines. Uh, being the offline rendering workflows. Uh, here's an example of the, some of the same game-ready mesh being converted for product proposals and 3D printed collectibles. As much of those renders may trick the eyes, they're, they're actually simulating scale and light conditions to really sell the imperfections of an actual de desk toy. Everything you see here is uh, mostly EV and cycles. Uh, nowadays, uh, I use Blender all around from the initial blocking stage to the final piece, and I love that, you know. The thing about the uh, porting and establishing workflows is uh, you're always kind of unintentionally dealing with the biases and quirkiness of various adoption decisions uh, behind it, and sometimes these visions are not aligned intended, uh, even if the original intention is genuine, right? That should be enough to impact there for most artistic-oriented people, uh, especially if you're just entering the market. Um, the job should always have the easiness of use uh, as the main goal, right? So I, I try to stay as close to my craft in and out of the, the digital realm as possible. Uh, building Gumpla and other model kits is as my main hobby nowadays. I would even dare to say that this is almost uh, a side profession by now. <laughs> And uh, I recommend every artist to embrace side activities that uh, enrich their understanding of the world and uh, the subject in which they specialize upon. Uh, if you're an environment artist, you know, go travel, take reference photos, visit your local car shop, ask the mechanics, you know, understand how the engines and motors work behind the scenes. Uh, experiences like that uh, really elevates uh, your art to the next level. Um, you know, and talking more about our hobbies, uh, airbrushing is a widely used tool uh, that I use to customize Gumpla model kits. You learn about the different aspects of uh, chemical properties of enamel and acrylic paints, air atomization, thinning. You are to have a very smooth coverage of the plastic surfaces. Uh, there's also the work of polishing, sanding, masking. So the possibilities are endless, and this contributed a lot to the way I try to represent my concepts in the digital form. Um, all this led me to create this uh, ever-expanding personal collection of surfaces, and I know most of you also have been dabbling with the Asset Browser for, for a long time. Um, and well, that uh, improved my output exponentially, uh, regardless, you know. Um, I can, can waste less time thinking about uh, user interface hassles and really focus on ideation. 
on top of that, every new seed which is generated can be saved for later reusability, right? So here you can see that all those materials are interchangeable, being able to generate like, a, you know, very big amount of variations in the initial structure. Um, and this allows for a high degree of flexibility, yeah, being that, you know, uh, the good thing is that it, it doesn't lose uh, resolution. So it, it remains sharp and preserve the details. And this factor really helps if you wanna bake them down into a texture and export later. Um, so let's dive into my way of working. Uh, beforehand, it's important to disclose all content in this presentation was made in version 3.6 before the AGX view transform uh, was introduced on 4.0 and uh, 4.1 and the principal BSDF node I also got more compact, as many of you may know, and our inputs and options are still there, however, just organized differently. Well, let's start about, about lighting. So lighting is almost everything in your work. It defines the mood, right? So to create a full material library, it's very important uh, that you work in a hue saturation agnostic environment for look dev purposes. Uh, this essentially kind of like reduces any discrepancies across bounce reflections and ensure like a consistency among all colors. So my red, blues, yellows are indeed pure and not being skewed by ambient lighting. Simple like, like box, uh, black and white HDRs can be a good starting point uh, for a solid foundation on that end. And another thing needs to be addressed, especially for the procedural parametric designs you saw beforehand, uh, that when I was looking at some references and I wanted to replicate some of, of uh, those uh, uh, ideations, it, it kind of became evident that I needed to be, uh, for me to achieve the same effects with, the, with base polygonal node primitive. Uh, although that's cheaper and less expensive to load, uh, I needed that those roundness uh, properties and uh, well, you can only do that with sign distance fields, right? So I was looking around and I, I'm a big fan of, you know, uh, Celestial Maze as well. Uh, Blender has good nodes by default, but they're not moderate enough when committing to more complex setups like that. In comparison, like you waste a lot of time creating things from scratch and uh, I recommend everyone going over the basics of vector math and functions before dipping your toes with sign distance fields. Uh, both Celestial Maze and Erringdale have great lessons on that. Uh, Celestial Maze Toolkit is free. You can find it on the GitHub uh, link both, and it contains more like 160 ut utility nodes with bra basic primitives. So, moreover, I wish they're included by default. You can save all those in your library for quick access. It also includes like uh, some 3D ones, but I mostly focus on the 2D fields as they're mostly cheaper. Um, and that's essentially how the geometric pattern is done. You know, uh, examples are the SD box, the SD anagon with variable sides and the equilateral triangle. Uh, here's showcase how you can use the built-in uh, SD viewer node to preview the fields by creating a compare math node. Uh, you can pick each, each one of the bands you want. As far outer you go from the center, the rounder the outline will be, and you can also use the epsilon value to control like uh, its thickness. So pay attention how there's an inverse proportional relation between the scale factor and its band size, which you may need to compensate later on. Uh, if you tie all, all that with a module vector node, you're set up for success, you know, and, and you can achieve a basic uh, procedural pattern like that. Uh, I'll order material setups uh, from my collection that are supplies more simple uh, than most people would expect. In this case, uh, the wave and the noise texture nodes are doing 50% 50, 50 of the heavy lifting. You can tweak the, tweak the mapping uh, and grunge scales to simulate tribal paints for you know, uh, all types of surfaces you want. For more advanced users here, uh, this tip may not come as a surprise, but it's such an overlooked aspect, I think it's worth uh, reiterating. Very commonly you can spot artworks in the wild and you see the colors are not as good as they could be represented. This of course should depend highly on the type of mood you're trying to convey, but because RGB linear is the default option for color ramps, 
although it may work for more analogous combinations, you're not getting gradients in its full potential for like uh, complementary and triadic uses. So for opting for a HSL, Q saturation line is, you can have uh, help achieve more vivid blends on your gradients. And the reason for that is quite obvious, like um, you're, you're doing the shorter path to reach the, uh, the, your outcome in the color wheel. So therefore, if, you're, if your range is too far away, you would end up with grays and the saturated values in between. Whereas with HSL, uh, you're getting the full strength of your values by going the long distance. This technique is particularly useful for car paint and materials with Fresnel variation especially on candy looks and complementary color combinations. You can see here. And other, like one of the most questions I get from coworkers and, and other folks ask me is uh, how to achieve the, the frosted glass transition looks. Uh, you can see some of my, when this works. Uh, where you really want a subtle variation from ultra clear to the light flat coat of paint. Um, well, that's a fairly simple setup as well. Although it has some like uh, caveats here and there to have it like uh, physically accurate, you, you got to remember to connect your values not only to the roughness property, which is affecting mostly like uh, non glass surfaces, but also the, to the respective transmission values, which uh, most people forget. This is why sometimes your glass shader appears broken or doesn't mimic the same desired effect. Uh, the purest is your gradient, the harsher, harsher the fall off will appear. So another factor is having your bright values always depending painting to the middle of the spectrum. Uh, yeah, you can also uh, pay attention how we're using the ease RGB transition type on the color ramp uh, to drive the, the clear coat roughness input here. This is important to get a very sparse black and white gradient that can exacerbate the, this type of transition. Another situation of proper value awareness is when you're using the bevel shader to fake merge topology on areas of like a dense intersection, such as the case above. In this material, we, we have a combination of stacked uh, shader techniques that rely on multiple normal inputs. And you gotta make sure to like plug the bevel shader data, not only to the clear code normal pass, which acts as an overlay on top of the most common PBR stack, but also the layer, layer weight node, which is driving the Fresnel effect. Uh, this tree may appear simple right now, but sometimes your layer weight can be inside node groups, and you may always want to remember to expose those values properly. So with a good base of the library out of the way, how do we proceed into exposing the values and making only the key parameters available in the main properties panel? Most people understand drivers mainly being useful within animation workflows, uh, but that couldn't be far from the truth. Uh, if you think about it, drivers allow you to have access to almost 90% of the values anywhere. For an easier approach, uh, I'll be using the urban camouflage material as an example, uh, which can be replicated fairly quickly with only two multiplied Voronoi textures. Here, uh, we'll be identifying its main artistic values that we aim to expose. So totaling up to five, the scale for each respective noise and their colors, which totals for three float arrays. First, we need to create five blank uh, values in the custom properties panel at the bottom of the material tab. You can do it like me and drag and drop that menu to the top of the list. Then create a new property. Uh, you can tweak the maximum limit of the float, uh, like the example here, I set it to 100. Once you're done, uh, left click on it, like copy as new driver, and left click on the input within the material editor you want to be mapped into. So select the option, paste driver, and you should be ready to go. Uh, but then we asked Lewis, how do we do it for colors? Well, colors actually fall under a float ray type property, and the process isn't that much different. Uh, you just need to switch the type dropdown and set it uh, subtype to linear color, simple as that. And then you have, uh, you can tweak the RGB. Here's the result uh, for all five properties, successfully driving the values in the source shader material. 
I can, can control the scale and even switch their, their colors for the camouflage. Moving on. It's always great to have your source.blinks uh, files mimicking its intended purpose. In this case, this is the root for all my entire library. So I like keeping the outliner view set to list all data types. With that, it's easier to mark them as assets and uh, as well as like having a little camera setup to quickly render your thumbnails on the fly uh, when I finish altering each material and each driver for each source and scene. In contrast, uh, the auto journey thumbnails work well, but most of the time you re really want to make your content easily readable and shown in its best intended use case. Uh, the light setup that I created adds like a bottom ring light to accentuate its presence across the plain gray background from the browser. It's not a subtle, uh, subtle change, but it, it helps a lot. So to add a custom thumbnail, select the asset, Remember, you need to be on the source.plane in which it's located. Click on the gear icon on the right, and then on the folder icon where it says preview, there is a catch for using uh, custom thumbnails, however. Uh, depending on the final image size, they can add up to the memory and loading times in which they appear on the startup. So for that, I opted to compress their file size further. Uh, using this open plugin called SuperPNG. Uh, it still beats Photoshop's safer web compression method miles away. Uh, this one's reduced from 112 to 15 without like uh, apparent visible artifacts. So they load quickly and you know, it also impacts your, your Blender startup times in a way. Um, so decals, decals differ from shaders. They are basically a Material applied to a transparent plane uh, alongside a shrink wrap modifier. So they are saved as an object type asset in the library. It's due to that uh, we're going to be exposing the drivers to the object panel instead, instead of the material properties for easy accessibility. The advantage of like SDF based decals is that differently from image based decals, you can have more, uh, more with less. So each design can be modified according to your needs. See how simple the crosshair decal can be replicated with uh, uh, OP polar node and the SD box nodes. You, when using the OP polar node, you can avoid uh, weird interpolations on stepped-like stepped decals by making sure to use an integer as a property type for the count number. So. That way, in between values will be skipped. Um, and for, I did this for art direction purposes, maybe you want this. Uh, and I also limited the crosshair stripes to two. Uh, many of you also may be familiar with the decal machine add-on, right? Uh, you can replicate uh, some of its techniques with SDF too. Uh, to do that, you can like uh, disable the ray visibility for glossy surfaces and also their shadows. This helps like to consolidate their appearance when high resolution renders are taken and uh, especially under like bright lighting conditions. This is a thing. Above all, um, you always want to use UV mapping for this technique uh, as the generated object space one doesn't translate well when using a shrink wrap modifier the auto drained coordinate mapping doesn't account for the offset of the shrink wrap. So by using UVs, you're always enforcing that it will map perfectly into the surface. UVs are also beneficial for situations where you want to duplicate the surface underneath and map into the decal with accurate precision. Just pay attention, the center will be offset, always being the 0.0, .0 origin coordinate. Here you can see the end result for all parameters exposed. Uh, the target decal is made in the same way as the crosshair, but masking a circle within the box SDF and inverting the alpha to obtain that result. Note mentioning, you can leverage the SDF nodes to create procedural bump map decals. 
this technique is not only like constricted to generic alphas, which can be very useful for composing tertiary and le levels of detail, where the insets won't have a significant impact on the silhouette of the model. Here is an example of its use on uh, Evangelion artwork, Revamp, based on, on an artist uh, named uh, Miratio. I found it to be like a great uh, subject of study to test this method as the nature of the design has lots of curved surfaces. So adapting 2D concept into 3D uh, is also a form of visual translation, right? Uh, the fundamental goal is to effectively, effectively convey an idea from one medium to another while retaining its essence and meaning. Uh, it involves considerations of depth, proportions, spatial relationships, and language on the other hand, you know, syntax, grammar, and cultural context. So that's why blocking out your layout is essential. You cannot move onwards without doing so beforehand. A successful translation for all those factors put together is what designers refer as appeal. Appeal unifies the final piece. And just like the principles of Gestalt, you can only attain it when all other aspects are working in harmony. Just like the purple is saying, like, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, for sure. Now, uh, we finally arrive to geometry notes, the part where I believe most people were waiting for. And uh, one of the in-house tools I adapted to my personal workflow is, is, is known as the inset maker. Uh, I created this group to automate something I did fairly often, which is like uh, creating variable cuts and indents. I use this to create the details in the car rubber tires as well. Uh, pay attention how the inset scale is variable when I shift the object orange in point. Breaking it down, uh, first we are using the instance on points node to map the source object into every vertex. This is controlled by a vertex group which is being exposed as a selection type. The align Euler to vector node is very important on this stage as well. Without it, our source orientations won't be aligned correctly to every vertex normal. And, and then we proceed into Boolean then out with, with a mesh Boolean node. This last step can be very costly on performance, depending on the source complexity of the, uh, of your, uh, and the poly count of the, the Boolean, right? Uh, in addition, since I wanted to replicate a parametric effect, I decided to add a RGB curve node to drive the vector scale output of each Boolean mesh. Uh, that allows me to have more control on the fall off of their scale relative to the source origin point. And the result is very cool uh, to play around, as you can see. This slide is showcasing how the selection is being exposed as a vertex group. I can handpick which vertices I want to be the Boolean to happen, uh, allowing for a higher like, degree of customization. Also, uh, make sure to check your source Boolean orientation rela is relative to the world. Sometimes you may want to apply their scale before proceeding to use as a cutter. So. Nevertheless, when you have curved surf uh, source objects or more complex surfaces, normal artifacts will be sure to happen and you need to be prepared to solve uh, those with a data transfer modifier. Uh, here, by using another selection of vertex groups, we can specify which areas we want the normals of the, or the, the mesh to be migrated over. And uh, you can so successfully overwrite their artifacts. Some of the kit patch parts that I use um, uh, are also composed by intricate combinations of modifiers and shape keys, just like drivers. Shape keys can also be leveraged outside of animation use cases. And uh, it's and be a strong foundation too for like concepting and detail stacking, right? Next, uh, we have uh, a hands-on example of all those techniques being combined to assist in modeling and concept concepting. I can control the bevel variation of the tire, its thickness, thread depth and many other like visual qualities that otherwise would be counterintuitive to, to model and change every time the client wants. 
you can uh, see how powerful this is, and it's all within Blender already. Um, please ignore the fact that the, their display is purple, you know. Uh, those are from circular dependencies as being an old file. Here's how everything is set up. We are selecting key values of the bevel modifier, uh, combined with a simple transform geometry nodes to, 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 to tweak its radius. It also has an array modifier to instance and bend the source mesh around. Uh, hopefully we can have a bevel modifier as a node in the future. Uh, that way I can convert this entire structure into a geometry nodes. Uh, that's the goal for most of the procedural primitives shown here. Another similar example of a procedural hubcap kit bash part. This one can achieve uh, equal types of uh, firm variations, you know. Uh, you can control the size, the distance, and the circular visual elements for bolts and other insets. Uh, you can see how I'm using like a simple mesh boolean node again to control how a cylinder primitive is offset into its main shape. Then I proceed into doing the same combination of array and simple, simple deform modifier to expose and repeat the pattern along. Although we can already port those into GN, it's essential that the bevel modifier becomes a node so we can better make use of its tolerance and angle settings. To sum it up, uh, here are some takeaways. Um, I think it's really important to acknowledge that understanding appeal is one of the most, you know, seeking after qualities on, on 3D artists nowadays and the current job market uh, mixed with uh, other, other uh, factors uh, unfortunately have been overlooking this aspect. So in a real production environment, the concept art is also responsible for providing its uh, so original references, which helps in guiding the translation process. Uh, this definition provides like uh, the necessary context that 3D artists then can improve and refine their the design taking the experience to the next level, right? And, you know, learning curves can be intimidating as a beginner, and everyone who's been through it for a long time can relate. Uh, in fact, uh, some of my, my 2019 talk was, was mostly addressing that topic. Here are some uh, other concept art uh, um, adaptations from Rock H, great. A concept artists, side views, up views, and I would like to first thank everyone working at both Blender Institute, uh, Blender Studio staff, uh, and the opportunity to present this year. It's always really great to be here, uh, connect face to face with everyone, and also big shout out to all those veterans and masters of equal tenor than myself, uh, if not even more. Some are retired, other, others continue developing add-ons and sharing their discoveries every day. So big standing ovation for them. Uh, last but not least, a friendly reminder to donate to the development fund if you haven't done so. And Q&A. Yeah. Yes. Yes, yes, you can find uh, on Celestial Mace's uh, toolkit uh, on, on his GitHub, and it's free. Everyone can download it and start using it. Uh, for the data transfer modifier? Yeah. Yeah. So that's most of the case. Um, nowadays, I was trying to replicate that setup with geometry nodes. You can already do that. But there are some quirks. Uh, you have to pass through the material pass now to do that because of the attributes. Uh, the thing about uh, I still use the data transfer modifier is because you can preview it on 
uh, object, uh, solid object modes instead of like the EV and cycles. Uh, so it makes more, uh, it's, it's more easier that way. But it's always a case by case situation, man. Like uh, sometimes you wanna use the vertex groups to isolate and you know see like which parts you wanna you wanna transfer the the normals. Sometimes you also wanna offset, do a like, little shrink uh, of the mesh to map correctly. Yeah. That yeah. Yeah. Um, it's like, how do you block that out? Because I got vertices around there that are being transferred that are also shared, right? Yeah, so on, on that, uh, there is a drop down uh, to select the vertex group. Yeah. So you need to leverage the vertex group to do that. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of the vertex group, yeah, yeah. Because when the vertices are shared, right, that's in like an area I don't want to have affected. So I do, because I usually end up having to make like a supporting section for that. Mm. Yeah, it's it's most like you you'd have to show me show me later the yeah 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 and then uh, we can figure it out together. Yeah, so sometimes you have um, uh, on the carpet especially, it's it's accounting for the bounce reflections for that. It's more of a artistic choice. You can choose to keep it. But I think the shadows are the most important one. Yeah. Maybe one question about the Boolean stuff as well. You showed in one of the last examples that you did the Boolean uh, for the real stuff setting, and then a bevel around the Boolean edge, which looks somehow nice with the way it's normal. Yes, this is a great. This is a great question, and I know it. So yes, you can see the the bevel is. It's changing slightly there, and it, it won't be perfect into, until we can have it as a node per se. But is so, it a new bevel or is it just like a different normal on that edge? Uh, this this one? Yes, it's this one. Yes, it's a real bevel. It's a real bevel. You can see it. It ev even has some normal artifacts still there, uh, if you pay attention to it. But from a like uh, tertiary level of if you're if you're seeing the prop from out, from afar, you know, uh, it for concepting it, it it works well. But again, if if you're if you're doing production work, then you know you're gonna retopo after that, and you're gonna make sure to fix those. But uh, it's a bevel modifier. It's it's driving a bevel modifier uh, on the stack here. This is the stack. Uh, the way to normal, well, it's uh, uh, it's doing the way to normal. So. <laughs> right. right. So uh, um, you can also do that uh, on the on the node group itself. You can migrate that. Um, in fact, because the thing is, um, sometimes you want to constrain the artifact, and you want you want to add edge loops procedurally to shrink that uh, gradient split, as he was mentioning. We can't do that precisely yet, so the way to normal helps into kind of stay here, yeah. stay here, yeah, doing that for the normal averaging. So, yeah. Um, Thanks everyone, and uh, I'll be open for questions and catch me on the, the roof later as well. Thank you.